Kate, are you, uh, can you inform us which school you are from, which discipline? Uh, my, uh, you, pardon? The school and discipline. Okay, no, I'm at the Center for Student Support Services. I am a social scientist. I'm in, trained in sociology, uh, involved in education environment. So I might bring in some provocative statements. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Can you please uh, share your screen and your presentation can start now. I will do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just for a moment. There I am. Okay, I hope you could see this. Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. So I'm on my way. I, I, I actually prepared, uh, well, cut my speech for long, quite some time because uh, of the time limits, but let us rush through it and, and have probably some good exchange afterwards. Uh, my presentation will touch on uh, to a few of these issues. I'm not going to labor each of them uh, as we will obviously get there. But what we were involved in is the development of a, a predictive analytical tool or testing of it, a pilot study that we were involved in. And that pilot study, study was sort of cut short because of the COVID regulations and so forth. So it started before and ended 2019, uh, end 2019 sort of. Uh, but whilst we did it, I had to go back and the whole team had to go back to the drawing board for all these uh, uh, analytical tools, uh, evaluation tools, and, 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 and basics uh, is the throughput rate of universities because that was the driver behind it all. Uh, and it seems now when we look back, uh, point number two there is that we are actually now in a new reality. Thinking back of COVID only is not good enough. We are slowly moving back into a contact situation, contact teaching situation for universities. We come from a needs driven exercise. We were dumped into it. We had to go virtual. And now we have to be ushered back into virtual teaching contact as an advanced pedagogy. And I think we will be looking back as we enter classrooms again in future, uh, we will be looking afresh at our contact situations. I think it will be a total different thing because we will be, we have had contact with uh, virtual teaching and we will be blending it to the betterment of contact situation. The focus will be on a contact situation for contact universities. But I'll come back to that. Uh, the danger is, and we have a dangerous animal on our campus. And that is, to that extent, it, it is that the first and second year students uh, of 21, 20 and 21 uh, are, uh, haven't had exposure to academia on a campus contact environment. They haven't had exposure to fellow student peer education talk and so forth. So we sit with third year students probably in 2023, 22, we're gonna sit with third year students students who didn't have a first year experience at all. But there's the elephants in the room that will always be us, with us. And this is concern of throughput rate. It's both a concern, was during the times, Professor Nye addressed that and how to get students through to a certain extent with adapted ways. And, and and it's still also a priority for university management simply because excellence in teaching and learning uh, is usually measured against throughput rate. But it could also be the result of 
poor academic standards. So yes, that's an open debate, what it will be and what is, carries the most heavy weight around these things. And that is why we embarked on this uh, pilot study of assessment of a tool, a predictive analytical tool. It took us back to the drawing board. The reality of the teaching environment, ladies and gentlemen, is very simple. The reality is there is no standard criterion, standardized criteria, other than school academic performance. If I have school academic performance, I am liable or may get access to university. Not even a criminal record would keep me from going to university. But there's a flaw in the system. All universities, all universities offer subjects that were not offered at school. So when I did a request on this, on what, how many subjects we offer, and so the, the, the result was the modules we offer at C, uh, University of the Western Cape, there were 2010 modules, 2019 that we offered. And probably only five of them would have a bearing probably on average, on school subjects. So we, students come from school with no quick and clue what's going on at university subjects. And at the end, there might be only one or two of the subjects that gave them access to universities uh, that might have some bearing on school content. So in short, I would say, students do not continue the academic education from where they left school. And this was a reality that we had to take cognizance of again. Another one is that is this total diverse environment that we are confronted with. All campuses have different cultures, different physical environments different is history where they come from. And all of this play a role into the ambience on the campus. And then you have different students coming from cultural family and educational backgrounds and school backgrounds. Uh, and, and, and that makes this whole uh, cauldron of, 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 of chaos environment where students find themselves in. And some of these unique elements in a certain combination, psychologists and all that all, could have a positive or a negative impact on my student performance, academic performance, as well as the throughput rate in the end. But the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, no student enters university to fail. It's not the purpose. It could have been avoided according to our staff always that if we have had time years intervention on that, uh, because we, we are dumped into a new social or edu social environment, which we have to navigate our ways. So it is a re-socialization process that we have to go through. But that re-socialization process should also be aimed to enhance the potential of academic, academic excellence. We are so narrowly focused on the struggling and students to survive and keep them in their system that we end up with the so-called neglected student. Uh, and that means, ladies and gentlemen, and when I looked at the data that I have in my research, they are often overlooked. These are the students probably 60 to 70%, according to my figures, of students that are often overlooked. They don't come, they sort of operate under the radar. They struggle on their own. They persevere on their own. They make ends meet somehow. And they ultimately just pass and they graduate. So this is what I call the struggling, just coping majority. That's the neglected student. I just want to go back to this slide. We do have early warning 
indicators at universities. But it is the typical thing of a class test. That's nothing more or less than that. It's class test. If I have a series of tests and I score low, low marks, I'm in trouble. And I sense it. And I'm in trouble. We have ex examinations that tell you, that, that would tell you, yes, you pass or you fail, you have failed just this million, or, or you fail just under a pass, whatever it may be. The problem is, these instruments is very simple, probably too simple. It's one dimensional uh, and basically always too late for intervention. And this intervention is actually needed earlier to put me on track for my... No, the instrument we piloted was the MapWorks, uh, Sky, Sky, Sky Factor MapWorks instrument. And when the results came out, ladies and gentlemen, we, we immediately saw something's wrong. I mean, it was in 2019, 68,6 of our students percent of our students suffered from homesickness. And that raised an alarm bell for us. And the way it was calculated, there were about 500 students involved. Only 70 students responded to the question. And it came up as the highest issue among our students. And so we were, when this whole process aborted, we have had access to the raw data and I could do analytics of the raw data that came in, how the algorithm worked and so forth. So we saw something is wrong here. Missed two or more classes, 68%. Low social aspects, 62%. That's what they suffer from. So what I did, I went back to the drawing board. 18 predictive analytical instruments, I dissected them. I looked into all each and every question of them and so forth for detail. And we came to some other conclusion and of these clusters that were measured. Now these were the clusters, clusters measured. Uh, you could see here, these 18 instruments, about 35% of of the clusters uh, are in all of these instruments uh, come from creative mind and thinking environment. They're trying to stimulate and measure my creative thinking, my uh, thinking ability and creative mind. They touch on self-motivation and you could see now social integration of, 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 of social aspects into academia and, so, and time managed as you carry on. These, these instruments all touch onto this. But we went to our students also, and we asked them what makes a successful student. Now we're looking through the eyes of our students. And the next slide shows on the right-hand side what the students thought a successful student is. If I look around me on campus, who are the successful people? The students, not the lecturers, the students say they are hardworking, motivated, show perseverance. Exactly. That is what they see in fellow peer students. What the instrument focus, instruments focus on are creative minded thinking. You see, it's quite further down here on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, question we asked the students, and it's up here. What was time management is up there, while time management is much lower here. We also asked the students uh, if they uh, look around them, what they saw, what's the successful students, the elements of it, and they asked them, what is it that you should work on personally? And there were 1,100 students that said, and they said it's better time management, irrespective of all these nice highfalutin words that we and philosophies we hold. The second one was hard work again, persistence. They want, they want to learn how to, to persevere more, improve study habits, self-discipline. And this 
focus of the popular stuff that you get on the internet and that's sold, sold on the market, so they sell it on the market, are quite further down. This is that make what makes self-discipline, you could see that, that makes the, that they want the information. And we also ask them what the, what the faculty should, uh, uh, sorry, and uh, now I have to move on, what the faculty uh, should train their students on. And when you ask that question for a simple reason, we ask the students, think of a university, what comes to mind? And then they say the faculty. So it seems to be that the faculty in our students' minds are the university. So we ask them, what should the faculty train you? And then something else pops up, writing skills, speaking communication skills, and then on time management, study methods, and so forth, reading comprehension. Now this could be different for different faculties, obviously it depends on the content of the faculty teaching. But whatever the case may be, this brought us into a new equation that needs to be in there. The communication one was a very, and we could talk about that later. But however, there seems to be a broad consensus among psychologists, educationists, and so forth, academics and researchers, that the vital first step for any, any student is to take responsibility, to take agency for who and what you are. If you don't take the first step in admitting I have a problem. You don't have a problem. And this is where we want to take the students with uh, predictive analytical instruments. Just as a sideline here, our focus group information showed us agency wasn't there. We asked them on, 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 on uh, priority of needs. What do they need? And they said they need study aid awareness, Made, must be made more aware. They must have open doors, bursary communication, better student. Everything there points, not to my own agency. They must do it for me. So this raised another alarm bell. And then we came to, to, to the access to internet and to facilities. Yes, we have 60% access to computers, but we have 50% access to internet where we stay at night. That was a computer, laptop, or not cell phones, computer, laptop, or an iPad, uh, and, uh, or a pad. And, and here we have, uh, half of our students have access when they stay at night. They are cut off from the internet. So it's another very important element. So we developed another instrument in the end, and we're getting close to the end now. And, uh, and we isolated from my dissection of these 18 instruments from uh, focus groups and from the pilot study, we came up to six clusters that is crucial, that could act as a warning sign, preventative warning sign for students. What is, where am I? Where do I fit in? Where should I work on, touch on to? And these clusters are academic clusters. And these are reading, writing. If, ladies and gentlemen, a student can't put his thoughts on paper, he's not gonna pass an exam. And a lot of students struggle with that. It came from the focus groups. That was, a, I meant something else, but it wasn't written there. So these are serious stuff. And, 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 and we came up with reading, writing, speaking, and listening in contact class. You must be able to focus and listen and study skills. Reading, writing, speaking, obviously it was this thing about communication, having uh, the, the ability to communicate and the self-assertiveness to communicate in English. Interesting one. Study skills. Sorry, yeah. uh, uh, you have two minutes left to wrap I up. I have two minutes left, I will. Uh, and these six elements were brought into this new instrument and we could give the student a, 
a layout of where his profile is better than others. This is an example, a real example of a, a student that was not so very good, not a good student. So what are the lessons learned? Sense-making. We should give students sense-making of external size, uh, signals and internal complexities, something that makes sense of it. It should not be an overkill, an academic overkill of dissecting my personal psychological inner self and the ego and alt and all those things. We must strip it from useless information. And it's designed to be a first and second tier intervention instrument. And it should be self-evaluation to activate this uh, agency in the student to be used as a monitoring and enabler to put the student in a position to see where should I work on. And this instrument is now in the phase of being tested. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, I will now open up for questions. Please feel free, raise your hand, and you can interact with uh, Dr. Devet's presentation. Uh, I find it quite fascinating. You actually spoke about activating the agency in students to learn. Um, can you elaborate on that? Because you had several instruments that you used, and, and from the instruments, it... Um, it was found that the students were expecting things from the institution uh, and that they didn't have this agency within themselves. Yes. Uh, the problem with that is, uh, uh, I, I stopped my share, is that correct? Everything is okay? You could hear me? Yes, yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, the, the problem that the agency thing is that... Uh, Students, may I say, that was our, our, where we come from. Uh, we went back to the drawing board. Students, first year students especially, don't know what they don't know. Because this is a total new environment, specifically in South Africa. Uh, students come from rural areas. They don't come, uh, if they are first generation students, they enter up on campuses. All with this idea, I am going to graduate, but they don't know what they don't know. And nobody informs them until they get totally derailed and end up with counseling. We want to avoid counseling, the so-called third level intervention. We want to say to students, if you could mirror yourself, this is where you are. You should take the first step. And if we could get him to do, uh, her to do that, I think we will make a difference in the student environment. Uh, but also, also for the excellent student, we could put, help the good student to become excellent. That's, that's a very, it's a spectrum we deal with. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So are you saying that we should actually do a kind of profiling right at the beginning when they enter the university? Absolutely, absolutely. And that profiling, according to the information I have, and which I dissected again, but which we tested on the campus, uh, should more or less address those six basic clusters of elements. Uh, and, and you see, <laughs> If we go into the international route with these instruments, we end up with students creating uh, thinking skills and critical thinking analysis skills, all those things on the top. And we miss the real thing. We also have this thing of socialization. I mean, students, you must be careful whether they could easily over socialize and not academically socialized. So this instrument is focused on academic achievement. So when we talk about academic socialization, we talk about how often do you discuss subject content with friends? Not how often do you go to the bar? Uh, something different. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like some questions from the audience, please. 
Anybody would like to raise a question or comment? Nothing. Okay. So uh, it so, leads me to thank. Sorry. Sorry. So it's it's Willie here, and I place on the chat space that I like the fact that the instrument looked at the student's perspective and compared with the academic stroke lecturer's perspective. I found that the the interesting the findings was very really interesting uh, in terms of these different perspectives. I could tell you what we did in the instrument we're on to test now. It's very interesting. We when the student react, the student get the average of all the participating students graph next to his own. So I would be able to measure myself against my peers. Where am I? Not where should I psychologically be, etc., cetera, and, and, and according to whatever stand, norms and standards. The point is, if I see most of the students around me suffers from stress, I'm also there. Or I suffer less stress than the students around me. So I'm sort of okay there. I'm trying to say to you is that as the students complete the instrument, especially twice a year, first uh, enter March somewhere, and, and, and the second semester, because there would be movement. Where should you work on? Where could you address a little bit? If you have a physical detriments or if you have whatever detriments you have, psychological, it would show to you, you must pay more attention to this. But the focus is academic to you, correct? I stripped it from, from all psychological well-being and wholeness. I stripped the focus, kept it to, if I want to pass and graduate, I must get the correct marks. Bottom line. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. We will leave the discussion there, but you can continue um, to discuss later if there's any other forum that we can discuss. Uh, the next speaker, I think the first speaker was uh, Timon Corsi Kavas. The speaker is not here, presenter is not here. Uh, then Ms. Seva, is it? I don't know quite how to pronounce him. Wolganati? Wolganidi, that's correct. Wolganidi, okay. All right, thank you so much. Wolganidi Teva, is, uh, topic is reflection on supporting students in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Ms. Teva, can you tell us which discipline you are from and which school? Um, so I'm a student counselor uh, um, and I'm in this College of Health Science. So I'm with Student Support Services. Okay, student counselor. Thank you so much. Yes, you may. What's the time now? Are my slides visible uh, in the proper format? Yes, uh, we can see your slides perfectly. Okay. Um, you can commence. Oh, can I suppose I need to keep my camera on? Uh, yeah, if you can, if, it's, if you if it'll allow you to keep your camera on, uh, you have enough data. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so 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 I think from a sociologist to a social um, a sign, from a so to a to a psychologist social work perspective, this is going to be slightly different. So good day, colleagues, and I'm really excited to share with you this brief presentation on reflections on supporting students in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. It's a presentation that's focusing on the students in the discipline of nursing in the College of Health Science since the beginning of 2020. Uh, and this presentation will highlight the first year experience and mainly the group interventions and the strategies of support. So in this presentation, I capture and I share the reflections of a year like no other. You know, when I look back at 2020, the dreams of the first years upon entering university, uh, I would share reflections on the team's readiness, reflections from our students and participation by our students. I share the journey and the experiences of every first year. And I will share some of my own experiences and reflections during this period. When we go back and look at acceptance at university, a student's acceptance into higher education is often seen as a first step to a successful future. In addition, it is anticipated to be a period of new experiences, unique opportunities, 
new connections, uh, independent living, newfound freedom and responsibilities. In the College of Health Science, Student Support Services has historically implemented a comprehensive intervention program, which is aimed at timelessly identifying and then promptly addressing factors that could impact student success. Welcoming the first years and preparing them for transitioning into higher education has always been a key focus to ongoing success. Then the much anticipated 2020 arrived, a year that looked bold and beautiful, that exuded hope and promises, and a year filled with possibilities and new beginnings. And whilst we looked forward to the many possibilities, we did not expect, nor could we be prepared for what the coronavirus brought us. Whilst each of us in our unique roles had to adapt as we learned, our experiences as a collective were similar. The pandemic presented an opportunity for a new way of thinking and working. Lockdown and a series of changes we had to implement for our safety and survival was new, it was overwhelming, isolating and unfamiliar. Through it all, we had to adjust and find a way to move forward in a new normal. So COVID-19 pandemic was declared a national disaster on Sunday, the 15th of March. For us as student support services, we needed to get our feet on the ground as quickly as possible and figure out what all of this meant for our students. Students in the discipline of nursing navigate the academic uh, terrain alongside clinical spaces, having to demonstrate knowledge, skills, and competencies very early in their academic journey. So the impact of COVID necessitated the increased psychosocial support. And our unique intervention at the time was to understand the needs of our students during the lockdown and pandemic. Whilst the national shutdown is over, we are far from being okay. We've lived through the shutdown then the varying levels of lockdown, waves one, two, three, and an anticipated fourth wave. We still work remotely. Students are still engaging with their academic program online. However, are exposed to the clinical component in communities, clinics, and hospitals. So the fear and anxiety on a daily basis is all too real. So in responding to this need, securing spaces for online psychosocial support was explored. And since March of 2020, the opportunity to engage online with first year students increased through the provision of dedicated timetable slots, three per week in semester one and one per week in semester two. And this program served to bridge a gap by helping our students transition to a new journey in creative and, and really engaging ways. This presentation will then highlight the opportunities and experiences of transitioning to online support and the outcome and the impact amidst the uncertainty that we all faced. From the moment the president declared COVID-19 a pandemic to be a national disaster on uh, Sunday, the 14th, 15th of March, the Ministry of Higher Education in conjunction with institutions placed all post-school education institutions an early recess and effectively suspended academic activities. Against this background, a number of critical interventions were put into place. And that included no student or institution being left behind and gave rise to the themes of hashtag save the academic year, hashtag save lives. This paved the way for critical decisions and innovative strategies of support to students from ministerial levels which needed to be supported and strengthened by the institutions. Our lives were altered drastically. The university's decision to move to online and remote teaching and learning provided a new experience for staff and students, requiring a shift from the traditional way of supporting our students. So in order to best prepare ourselves, a series of processes followed. And due to the limited time, I'm unable to elaborate. However, the list is comprehensive and may be familiar to many of you. Starting off with the college uh, state of readiness report in terms of teaching and learning, the business continuity plan, 
uh, our student wellness and academic transformation program, understanding the needs of our students, our lockdown experiences survey, followed by the leaving no student behind uh, a, a strategy, our peer wellness and academic wellness programs, the dry run during May uh, with first years, the reintegration, reorientation uh, program during the risk adjusted strategies, the catch up plan in August and access to online learning platforms in all areas. The psychoeducation via themed audio and visual infographics from student support and our toll free lines and email that is dedicated to act, uh, for, for students to access for ongoing support. So first entry students in 2020 were supported through a number of initiatives since orientation and prior to the COVID pandemic and shut down. And this included peer wellness mentoring, academic mentoring, academic and psychosocial skills, um, as well as individual counseling. Their overall wellness needs were already determined via the SWOT strategy, as you can see on the slide. Um, in this, according to this intervention, 65 of our students were out of 80 were flagged for urgent intervention and the intervention and support had already commenced. So the strategy then guided the support required through the dry run, through the reintegration and orientation, and is on and through the ongoing timetable slots the entire 2020. However, we needed to learn more. Learn on the we needed to learn about the impact that the lockdown was having on our students and how they were coping in that context, which led to the development and the release of what we termed the lockdown survey. So the lockdown survey aimed to immediately understand circumstances of our students and the primary themes that emerged from this survey included anxiety, panic, fear, uncertainty around the academic program, fear of failure, mental health, presentation, mental health presentations and challenges with online learning, devices and data, the interruptions in electricity, which was impacting connectivity. The learning environment and the home responsibilities have been reported as having a negative impact. Majority of the students were consulted with us individually and in crisis during this time, struggled with issues of anxiety over the uncertainty, fear of not connecting with fellow students, staff and the university, fear of not coping with the transition firstly to university and then the strike action in early 2020 and then finally the lockdown. So for many students, the lack of space and resources conducive to studying uh, the data, the connectivity, et cetera, at their homes impacted and they're focusing on their academic load and has created further anxiety and stresses. The lockdown survey uh, shared many of the students' voices. The verbatim feedback reflects students' lived experiences and are all such valuable comments. Um, you know, so I can't really share all, but I'm hoping that you can see lots of the comments that are on the slide. And, and one of them, which I can share is, it's hard to study. It's hard to attend all the Zoom sessions. The house is full and the children make noise. I feel anxious, hopeless, and constantly disturbed. Another uh, uh, verbatim response is, it's really not easy having to teach yourself a whole course. As much as this online teaching has started, we as the students are the ones doing most of the work. We just transitioned from high school to varsity. Some of us haven't even found our feet. All of this is just too much. We have tests coming up, assessments, etc. I seriously can't afford to repeat this year. Otherwise, I will lose my funding as I am funded by a private sponsor. So these are critical things coming through from our students' voices. When we participated in the dry run in the week of 18th to the 23rd of May, the discipline of nursing created three slots for us in which we interacted with our students as for the slide in front of you, which shares the aspects that we had covered and the uptake of the support. And during the session, we had run polls. And in these polls, we had we basically learned a lot about our students in terms of where they were logging in from, um, so how they were feeling, some of their the, the experiences uh, in, in being in this lockdown and at home. And what was it that they actually required for us to, to, to put into place to further support them? And while supporting and preparing our students for the online platform, staff were simultaneously reflecting on their state of readiness. 
Um, and some of the, the critical questions that we were asked were, as you can see, you know, are we a staff ready? What are we offering? What's working? What's not working? What are the gaps and the challenges, et cetera? So looking back now, I reflect on how difficult it was to realize at that time, the answers to these critical questions. This was all new to me as well. And I note that I didn't offer much depth then. And if I were asked these very questions now, I probably would answer it differently. However, at that time, uh, myself and our team looked at these questions and thought that we thought we were ready, but we needed further training. We were not technologically advanced and we were doing the best that we could at the time. We were offering a lot. We were offering as per the business continuity plan. We were marketing our services and we had lots of support online, developed infographics and uh, uploading lots of information to support our students through their mental health uh, crisis that they were experiencing. We found that our student wellness and academic transformation program was working. We learned about our students before they went on shutdown. We knew who were flagged and we needed to, we knew that we could continue to support them. Our peer mentors were in place and they were offering ongoing support. What wasn't working was that although the students were flagged, we felt that they couldn't really, they weren't really accessing our support. They were not accessing material, email, they were not responding to all the attempts to actually offer them more support. And there were some challenges, as you can see, and, and um, you know, the Wi-Fi internet connection for both staff and students was, uh, was critical, confirming appointments with students because many preferred WhatsApp contact, et cetera. And to go further into uh, our reflections as a staff, as a team, what, did we, what do we need to enhance efficiency? We thought that we needed to consider this, the distractions and the limitations when working from home being counselors, the issue of confidentiality, uh, cell phone reception, and just having to limit our voice conversations uh, and aiming to offer more email sessions and counseling is generally a very verbal interaction. Some of the gaps, students not having access to Wi-Fi and, uh, or, or network to access the support, uh, support and input from disciplined role players was critical, but somewhat absent. Uh, accessing of classless, uh, uh, Moodle, et cetera, proved to be challenging in those early days. There was a low uptake of services. In terms of the role players that we needed to be actively involved in collaboration, we were collaborating extensively with peer mentors, academic mentors, the ADO, our year coordinators, our, uh, and that proved to be really helpful. However, we found out that there was a divide between the academic team and the support sector, which needed to be bridged as we were all working on the same page. And although we provide different services and our roles are different, we needed to come together in this difficult time. So how did we further address the needs of our students during COVID? Since May, a number of workshops are facilitated to the nursing cohort. And the next two slides, including this is merely just a summary of the themes that we covered and does not reflect the number of sessions, which in reality were too many. Okay, Sorry, so it started Ms. off. You, you have two minutes left. Wow. So it started off by, uh, uh, by reintroducing it and the students into the university platform, taking them through a host of academic skills. Uh, and then we focused a lot on the psychoeducation around what was emerging as a crisis again amongst our students in terms of their mental health and wellness. In addition to this, we found that we were having getting referrals from our uh, from the school boards and teaching and learning teams in terms of student safety, substance use, and pregnancy. So all of that was factored into workshops. Uh, the workshops were as interactive as possible, almost creating the need to be almost as though we were face-to-face. -face. And here in front of you is a list of all that we try to incorporate into our online workshops including the Moodle module, which offered lots of resources free for our students to access. I did an impact uh, of the program. It was not possible to share with you on this platform the evaluations of every session, because it was really a lot. So the overall impact shared with us that students, uh, majority found it extremely impactful and they 100% said that it needs to continue with first year students. Uh, some of the verbatim the feedback was I learned how to cope with my suicidal thoughts and depression. I am not okay, but I'm coping and working on it. 
Um, lots of them indicated that the workshops were great and they didn't really have much, many suggestions for its improvement. They, uh, they enjoyed the, the, the platform. I would like to just share my reflections very quickly. Uh, it was a long journey with many mountains to climb, as I'm sure many of the staff would feel that. Personally, I was often, it was anxiety provoking as always also new to me. I was living the COVID experience and uncertainty at having to offer unconditional support across my personal and professional space. I was technophobic, I make no excuses. Working from home translated into living at work. Uh, students, RAs, RMAs had easier access to us, to me, private cell, to my private cell number, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, I required my own debriefing to forge ahead, long hours, unrelenting emergencies, and online fatigue. Professionally, it seemed that there was a drive to do more, to compensate for being online and offer more and more to our students. One online session required a lot more administration than one face-to-face -face workshop. And it was not easy to plan, facilitate the, the admin around the sessions. Uptake was poor. And uh, the participation from those many of the students who attended was actually uh, really poor as well. It was difficult to track students who log on and appear to be there would actually disappear. So this was certainly a period of tremendous growth, both technically and creatively. A great sense of accomplishment and pride personally and professionally was overwhelming to be able to connect with students across geographical domains and implement strategies of support during these unprecedented times. The need for student support reverberated across the discipline and college. Strengthening the collaboration with peer mentors, class reps, year coordinators and academic teams served to strengthen not just the support to students, but the invaluable need for ongoing stakeholder collaboration. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Deva. That was a very insightful presentation of what the journey that you have been through and the students in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, uh, it was also, um, you know, laid with emotions as you went along of what uh, the whole experience was like for you. Uh, I now open it up for questions. I invite people to interact with, with Ms. Stavis' uh, presentation. Well, Ganathi, I would like to uh, say to you, you sound like each and every colleague I have on campus, on, on, in our unit, student support, so it is exactly what you are saying. I have experienced one thing, and also like you mentioned at the end now, is that students seem to have learned how to deal with these workshops that we offer. Yes, they do disappear. They, do, they don't pitch up. They don't commit. Uh, and that was what I've learned now is, is, is a serious thing in all the efforts that we put into it. And we end up with one-on-one -on -one crisis students after hours. Isn't that the truth? Absolutely. So, so the number of crises. How, how do you deal this this group thing? I mean, we have workshops, but how can we get? You see, there, there, there's an elephant, another elephant in the room. Uh, I have I've observed students. Now, again, it's interesting for me to hear from you as a psychologist's point of view. I've observed students when they use their cell phones. When we send messages for group activities, etc., or when we send them a video, they're busy with a video, uh, a coursework on their laptop. As soon as the WhatsApp next to them on the cell phone says, ping, they stop everything. <laughs> it is this thing of, they don't know what I'm busy with now to prioritize that. It seems to be that the academic electronic communication plays second fiddle every time. Mm. 
So, so yeah, yeah, I don't know. That I, I, I appreciate your comment and I'm really glad I'm speaking, uh, you know, the same language of all the colleagues that you even work with at your university. Um, yeah, it, it's like we, we often uh, find that at the moment we are dealing with crisis on a daily basis. And it's, it's, it's aspects that also have been addressed within a group context, you know, and if a student is attending and is learning the skills to actually, you know, cope and self-actualize, we didn't need to handle as many crises as we are. So I'm hoping that with a recommendation going forward that we'd be able to in, embed support of this nature into timetables of students going forward and that you know it could carry some kind of a credit to it so that students can actually become more involved and take it a lot more seriously. Thank you, Ms. Teva. Uh, any other questions? Is somebody else joining here? Yeah, I, I heard what you said that, you know, we kind of spending so much of time online and trying to compensate for the fact that we are online and uh, trying to ensure that, you know, our service can kind of match the face to face service. And but that's taking a lot out of the staff. So um, has there been any kind of um, attempt at employing more people in the support services sector, or is there a need for more people to be employed mm. to, you know, absorb this kind of pressure? Mm. So yes, so there, so the there's a college, there's a university wide uh, strategy of taking the first year experience onto a greater level uh, next year. It is going to be, well, it's, a, it's an initiative together with the university teaching and learning team and, and all four colleges. So the first year experience is going to actually have a whole team of newly employed first year facilitators, coordinators, uh, administrators, et cetera, to be able to better support students in these spaces with all these workshops uh, and, and their needs that I've shared on this platform that one person was doing, you know. So we're gonna have a whole team in place. Each college is gonna have quite a number of additional staff members to support us through that. Okay, so that's, that's very good news. Because yeah. we need to uh, actually help students transition into university uh, studies in the first place. And hopefully by second year, they would be able to cope on their own. All right. Is there anybody else who wants to add anything, make a comment or have a question? If not, thank you very much, Ms. Teva, for that wonderful presentation of yours. Uh, thank I think you. we all can say that we enjoyed it. And also feel what you were going through in, in this process. Okay. Thank you so much. May I ask to be excused because I have to attend, I do a presentation in another stream now. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much You're and excused. all the best. Thank you. Okay, cheers, bye. Okay, and then uh, who's the next presenter? So is Suzanne Stokes here? No. Um, Zinin, Zininzi, Anele, oh my, is Anele here? Tembenkosi? Not yes. Okay, Sanjay, I think you can do your presentation now because there doesn't appear to be the other presenters here. Thank you, Chair. I just want to make sure that I've got uh, whatever documents I need on the okay. screen. I'll just introduce and, you. This uh, is uh, Dr. Sanjay Soni. He's from the School of MAKE, College of Law and Management Studies, and he's presenting. So I've also co-authored this paper. He's presenting a paper on the findings um, on the mentorship program in the School of MIG. Thank you, I will hand over to you. And what time is it now? Okay. All right. It's 13, uh, nearly quarter past 15. one. Yeah, okay. Yes. All Thank right. you very much, Chair. And uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm wanting to talk to you very briefly about the, the mentorship program 
in the school of MIG. Uh, MIG is Management, Information Technology and Governance. So that's the, the school that uh, I represent. Uh, this uh, mentorship program uh, is, is a fairly new intervention in the school. And uh, it was launched in the second semester of 2020. Uh, it is uh, a program that uh, is as a result of uh, what we refer to as a Senate intervention. So it was decided by Senate to uh, have such a program in the school to address the issue of many students who are so-called pipeline students uh, who are taking a little longer to complete their qualifications than is normally the case. So what I want to do basically is, uh, owing to time constraints, I just want to touch on some of the important issues here. Uh, I just like to give you some sort of perspective on uh, our experiences with the mentorship program. Um, I just want to increase the, um, I'm not sure if you can actually see on your side the information on the screen. Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Right, just by way of introduction, I think a very, very important point to accentuate on here is the, the, the fact that, uh, and it's actually shocking, you know, when I looked at the stats, that nearly half of all university students actually drop out in the first year in South Africa. Now, this is actually very, very concerning uh, you know, you have a cohort of students, so you have 100 students in the class, and by the end of first year, uh, you have 50 that have actually dropped out. Now, this is obviously a, a huge concern, and uh, there have been a number of studies that have been done uh, on particularly mentorship, for example, uh, specifically in terms of how mentorship can actually help to try and circumvent that dropout rate and improve the, the success of, of students. And uh, what actually happens is that due to the fact that uh, you have uh, a lot of these pipeline students, a lot of students in the system that are not actually passing, uh, you find that universities uh, under great pressure to provide some sort of academic support to, to improve throughput rates and improve graduation rates and things like that. So as I mentioned to you earlier on, uh, this intervention that we refer to as the mentorship program, uh, a Senate mandated uh, intervention uh, was introduced in the school of MIG uh, in the second semester of 2020. And the focus of attention basically was on what we refer to as the M plus category uh, of, of students. So in other words, students that were in the system for a little longer than they actually should have been. Now, essentially what happened is we, we identified some students. In fact, we, we identified 142 students in this pipeline category. And uh, this mentorship program was actually initiated uh, in 2020, specifically focusing on trying to mentor uh, these 142 students. So what I'm going to try and do, and as I said earlier on, I, I do realize that we, we have time constraints. So I want to be very brief in terms of uh, what I cover here. I also want to point out that, you know, the, the mentorship program is a new program. Uh, a, a lot of the, the mentorship and, and whatever is associated with it in terms of how to improve here and what do we do there and so on, is actually work in progress. So, you know, we, we're learning from experiences as well. Uh, so essentially what I want to do is accentuate on that fact that it's, a lot of it is actually work in progress. Uh, but what I want to talk about is, is the, the mentorship program in terms of some sort of evaluation on that particular program. Now, over the last few days, what I've actually done is, is compiled some very interesting literature in the area of mentorship. And I'd like to share with you some of this information. Now, in terms of mentorship as, as a support mechanism for pipeline students and students who are actually having difficulty in achieving 
success in their studies and having other sorts of problems. There's a lot of information on mentorship uh, in, in all the paraphernalia out there, journal articles and things like that. I just want to highlight to you some important pointers. Um, essentially, you have emphasis on things like it's, it's hierarchical. So hierarchical as in different levels, different steps. So you have that type of mentorship where you have, let's say, a lecturer or somebody at that level, let's say, who mentors and supports and advises a student who's below. So that's hierarchical. And of course, you also get what we call the, the more peer type of mentorship where you have a student, maybe a senior student, a master's student, uh, who supports in terms of advice and mentorship, somebody who is lower down. Now, in terms of the uh, special mentorship program that we have in the school or MIG, uh, particularly in 2020, the, the, the type of format that we followed was both hierarchical as well as <clears throat> a peer type of mentorship program. In other words, what we had was we had situations where uh, young lecturers were actually chosen to, to do mentoring, as well as uh, ADOs, ADOs standing for Academic Development Officers. They were also chosen to, to take part in, in mentorship. So essentially, the, the, the modus operandi, or the, the, the type of mentorship that we used was a hybrid model, basically. We had a hierarchical approach, as well as a, a, a peer mentorship approach to, to our mentoring. As I pointed out to you earlier on, there's a, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of literature. We took cognizance of this uh, before implementing the program, highlighting the fact that uh, a mentor really is a friend, is a supporter, is a motivator, for example, and I'm quoting from the, the training manual, uh, who actually has a very important role as a role model, for example, to play as a listener. And uh, we, we obviously took that into cognizance. Now, all this paraphernalia, the, the, the mentorship training module, manual, uh, other information on if a student, let's say, is experiencing problems of a psychological nature, for example, or of a social nature, for example, there were a whole lot of bits and pieces of information that we put together what we did was that we, we put it onto the, the Moodle website. And obviously, the intention was that uh, that was a very important point of reference that students uh, or the affected students could actually go to in terms of looking at and, and hopefully helping to support them in their, their academic studies. So essentially, as I said, you know, we, we, we were mindful of exactly what we meant to do here in terms of mentorship focus of attention really was that we have to try and support, we have to try and, uh, you know, create some sort of example based on the mentors that we used as role models, people who succeeded in their studies and, you know, people who excelled in their work. So, you know, the, the mentees, as we call them, the students that were part of the program actually looked up to them and, and, and wanted to actually follow in their, in their footsteps. So that obviously was indeed a step in the right direction to help the, the, the affected students get motivated to, to, to actually perform. So we, we obviously took cognizance of the fact that a lot of what we did was, was a supportive function. Now, indeed, as in any program, support program, in this case, mentorship program, there are bound to be certain challenges. And, and this program was no free of challenges. Um, if you look at the literature, for example, there's a lot of literature on the, the different types of challenges that, uh, that are faced in terms of mentorship. Uh, things like, for example, uh, students who are resistant to being mentored. They, they, don't, they believe that nobody can actually mentor them. They can, they can do it themselves. So you get that cohort, you get that particular type of thinking. Of course, there were also time, also time constraint problems. Uh, there are also problems in terms of uh, mentors, let's say, not being very well trained, not very well prepared. We're obviously very mindful of this. So 
what we basically did was mentors via the Moodle site were provided with as much information as we could possibly access in terms of preparing them for the, the mentorship task. So that was, was underscored as, as an area of great importance. But indeed, we, we obviously recognized the fact that, you know, there would be challenges. And we were, mind you, we were up to the challenges. We, we were prepared to actually face the challenges. And uh, we did it through documentation, through uh, me- frequent meetings with mentors, training and things like that. Um, it's very, very interesting from, from all the different studies that, that we looked at, and, and these are, mind you, very recent studies on mentorship, that by and large, you know, to sum up all the information that I, I have on the, the slide here, that, that mentorship indeed is something that seems to work very well in, in most situations. In fact, from, from most of the information that, that I looked at in terms of journal articles and so on, there was but I think one study that found that the grades of mentees were on average not as high as the grades of those who were not mentee. So that was one of the, the points of departure in terms of you know, success of such programs. But by and large, uh, mentorship has been found to be very, very effective in, in supporting students on many, many different fronts, uh, whether it be in terms of success uh, in their education, be it in terms of addressing uh, problems of a psychological nature, or social nature, or financial nature, or connectivity nature, or whatever else the case may be. But generally, from all the readings that I've done and come across, mentorship by and large has played a huge role in terms of contributing to, to success. I mean, one particular study, for example, that, that, uh, or a case in point that I can draw your attention to is the one that was done by Dos, Reese and Yu, the 2018 one here. And it was done with economic students, for example. But what it found that the, the, the students on the mentorship program actually excelled much higher on average in terms of grades and, 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 and you know, end result than those that were not mentored. So there's a lot of information. There's a ton of information to actually support the uh, intervention program like a mentorship as being something that uh, has a huge important role to play uh, in in a university. Uh, For example, 71.7%, according to Etzel et al., found that mentorship was helpful. So... There were, there were also studies, for example, if I look at the second to last one on this, on this page, during the COVID-19 lockdown, for example, that, you know, where you had students who uh, perhaps would have been demotivated and, and, and having problems in, in studying effectively and so on. And mentorship programs uh, were found to be quite effective also during COVID-19, during the lockdown period, in helping to bring about success. And it goes on on the next page, for example, where uh, there's a a lot of documented literature on the the fact that mentorship and and mentorship interventions actually help contribute positively to better grades, better feeling of integration and connectedness to the university, for example, improving transition experience, for example, improving self-confidence and all these important things. So I think... The bottom line basically is that we, we, we're talking about something that has a great amount of evidence, a proven track record of actually contributing to uh, success amongst students. Sanjay, you have two minutes. Uh, there's a whole lot of other information that uh, are, is, is, is on the slide about, for example, best practices in mentoring. You know, they talk about academically successful mentors. So, to bring about the best practices in mentoring, it's important that you have or you, your choice of mentors is such that they have a successful background in, in mentoring. And also what we've also tried to do in, in our mentoring program uh, as, as, as a best practice is to provide them with the, the requisite resources and, and guidelines. Uh, I just want to point out to you that the, 
in, in, in terms of the school or MIG, the development of the, the mentorship program, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier on, we had pipeline students, so the so-called M plus four students. What we did was we, we set up a, a, a Moodle course page. Uh, all these students were participants on that particular page. And uh, we had a contact list for whatever important support activities that we felt would be important to mentor these students in terms of mental health, financial support, and other important pieces of information. Uh, we also devised reports for both mentors as well as mentees. Mentee reports had to be submitted twice a month. Mentor reports had to be submitted once a month. And uh, essentially, due to the fact that we, we have constraints in terms of time, just to point out in terms of research methodology, 142 students, for example, uh, we had document analysis, for example, monitoring participation. And, and the long story short, basically, is that at the end of the day, after the mentorship program, of the 142 students who took part, we had close on to 60%, 58.4% that completed their degrees. And the belief quite strongly is that the, the mentorship program has been quite effective in contributing to students finishing off their degrees. Uh, 18 and 25 students had one module and more than two modules respectively to complete their degrees at the end of 2022. So, you know, the, the, the conclusion basically from, from all of this is that this mentorship program seemingly has actually worked very, very well. And uh, perhaps maybe going, going into the future, you know, to, to, to have mentorship programs that, that are more specific to a certain discipline. So if you from economics, it's important to have a mentor who's an expert in economics actually mentor you and so on and so forth. So uh, sorry, Chair, I've taken up a lot of time, but uh, in conclusion, I think that's an important recommendation or piece of advice that, that I could provide as, as, as a coordinator of this program, that it's important to have uh, subject-specific mentoring. And, and that would make a, perhaps an even bigger difference at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, I'll now open it up to questions. You can stop sharing, Sanjay. Oh, yes. And, and, and by the way, I just want to point out that uh, there's a reference list here. If anyone's wanting that, there's a whole lot of references based on my slide presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, questions? Sanjay, may I come in here from my side, David? Yes. I, 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 do, do, is it a mentorship program? I'm also a part of a mentorship, mentorship program, but I'm asking now is, is it voluntary for the mentees uh, in the program that you were designed or involved in? Uh, or, or is it compulsory? And again, undergraduate, or does it include postgrads? Thank you, uh, uh, Prof, for the, the question. Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's basically an undergraduate program. You know, pipeline students who are not completed with their first degrees. And uh, we've obviously uh, obtained a list of such students, and we put them onto a Moodle course. So to answer the question of is it compulsory or not, you know, it would appear that in terms of the Senate intervention program, you know, it's mandated by Senate that these students must take part in such a program to try and improve uh, their success rates. Must take part, yes. Uh, any, may I call it, penalty if they don't? Well, not really. No, no penalty. Prof, but, uh, you know, ideally what we try and do, and I send out a whole lot of communication to them that please, it's an important program, it's for your own good, you need to take part. And, uh, you know, obviously there would be some that would not take part as well, but there's no real penalty. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? 
No more questions. And I thank you for your presentation. Is there anybody else who's still uh, going to present from the attendees present? So Suzanne Stokes, I believe you are not, you've withdrawn your paper. Uh, is Anele here? Not sure what has happened. She is. And Timben Kosi. Gavasi, not here. Uh, okay, so we don't have any more papers. I would actually, um, it leaves me now to thank uh, you for attending the presentations on this track. All the presentations came from different perspectives and um, were very inform informative and provided us with insights into the challenges the university uh, it currently is facing and some of the solutions uh, that have been experimented upon. And we will continue to take this into the future, to take these strategies into future years. So um, I was also asked to remind the attendees to complete evaluations. I'm not sure um, if you have a copy of these evaluations. Um, yeah, all right. Thank you very much. I will now close the session. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.